Be yourself. You don't need to try and be like your brother or your father or your uncle or whoever, okay? You've got to be yourself. Every one of us have got something that's special. What we've got to try and identify, what is special for you? And when you understand that, go and do it. I'm having as much fun now and much enjoyment from doing what I'm doing than I think I've had in all my career. Hi, I'm Rob Langton. Our interview series delves into the lives of Australia's most respected property thought leaders and decision makers and uncovers what makes them tick. This is the interview. Our next guest this morning is David Smorgan, OAM, member of one of Australia's most recognised business dynasties and CEO of Point Made, the nation's preeminent family advisory firm. Now, for over 25 years, David was a senior executive at Smorgan Consolidated Industries, one of Australia's largest private companies, before being elected president of the Western Bulldogs Football Club, a role he held for some 15 years. David was also Executive Chairman of Family Business Advisory at PwC and is current Chairman of Generation Investments, his family investment company, and also Point Made. Now, David, it's a pleasure having you on the program. We'll get to your upbringing and, and career a little bit later on, but let's start with the current business environment. You've been involved in business for many decades. What's your reading on the strength of the economy at the moment? Well, we're going through a very tough time. Uh, that goes without saying. The whole world is going through a tough time. And I'm no economist, so bear that in mind, please, Rob. But my view would be that Australia is coming through the COVID crisis in as probably stronger position as anywhere else in the world. I think there's a lot of sectors that are doing very well as a result of what we've gone through the last 12 months. But clearly, there's a lot of sectors that are doing it tough. You wouldn't want to be involved in a university uh, with, the, with a gap of overseas students unable to, to come in. You wouldn't want to be in the hospitality industry. You wouldn't want to be in the tourism industry. You wouldn't want to be in the airline industry or the cruise line industry. Like with the bad, there's always some good and there's people in between. And there's a lot of people doing it tough. I applaud the government's policies and the JobKeeper in particular. I think it grates all of us that there are a lot of people that are just taking JobKeeper and don't want to go and work. And so um, at a couple of functions earlier this week, heard from business people, cannot find people to do the job. They're going along to Centrelink, they're going along to recruitment agencies. People don't want to go and pick fruit. A lot of youngsters don't want to go and bend their back to earn a buck. They can stay home and earn job keeper. So hopefully within a few weeks that's going to come to an end and then hopefully they'll be able to go and be forced to get a meaningful job. So the Australian economy I'd say has been very resilient um, with those variances between sector to sector. Uh, I think it's going to be volatile. Obviously the market is holding up, I think, because there's nowhere else to put your money at the moment. So people are looking to buy Australian equities and so our market's held up very well. And uh, I think we're coming through this under control. Uh, the Commonwealth Bank results yesterday were, were positive. Lifting the dividend was a confidence boost. And I think the last thing is, from what I gathered, both the consumer and the business confidence is at a seven year high. So that says something about people's attitude, the way they're looking at the future, notwithstanding the tough situation we're all going through. And on a macro level, what do you see are the biggest challenges facing Australia over the medium to long term and how should businesses be adjusting their strategy? You're forcing me to become almost a politician here to think about, well, I'd be worried about China. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about China as a macro huge issue. Even the thought of them building a, what, a $20 billion city in Papua New Guinea just on our doorstep is not exactly what, what, what we'd like to happen, I don't think. But the trade issues with China, and yet Australians are showing they're very innovative and moving away from China to other markets. I heard today some people are selling wine into Kazakhstan and Kabakistan. Good luck to them. But that's what you've got to do. When one door closes, another one opens, and that's an opportunity for entrepreneurship and not just accepting the status quo. I think we've got an immigration issue too. I think we've got a large country. We've built up uh, a lot of services um, and we've got 25 million people, but where's the population growth going to come from? And so I think immigration and the debate about immigration, you know, is a huge issue. We need people to cause demand. And when there's no demand, there's no supply and everyone's, everyone's worth it off. So I think China, immigration, um, what are the next big projects? I mean, Australia, we keep on talking about the Snowy River, but that's <laughs> even before my time. Um, and yet that's not going to be the, the biggest problem solver, I wouldn't think. But um, 
It's a very difficult question to answer from someone coming from where I sit at the moment, Rob. <laughs> You're a, a noted investor in, in business opportunities, equities and property via your family business generation investments. Take us through the types of opportunities you're either investing in now or have invested in over the past, say, five to ten years. Well, there's been a variety of them. Uh, generation, which is my family business from my three sons. We've looked at uh, all things A through Z. Um, we ended up investing in some specialised technology organisations because we don't understand technology and so we decided after a couple of wins and a few losses, right, of trying to pick winners, that was not the way to go. So we've been investors in a couple of technology specialist companies so we've given them the responsibility of managing our money into that sector and that's been, that's been pay, paid off. There's been a number of uh, direct investments in a range of um, a range of different businesses, Rob, but I think mostly important, we, we more back the person than the, than the business. So the business might be a great business, but if we don't like or don't see eye to eye with the owners, operators of those businesses, we generally def defer and would rather back the person than the business. And in your role at Point Made, what type of advice have you provided your clients over the past 12 months, given the challenges that Australia and, and the world's faces? Faced, and how has this advice um, differed significantly, you know, to previous years? Oh, I think it's 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 been strengthened by the fact that the world has changed, and don't think you can just go back to doing the normal thing that you've done previously. You might have had a great business, but COVID has come and hit, and it's changed the way we do business. The whole issue about whether we're going to work in the office anymore or stay at home, huge issues now. And at first, I think we all joked about it. Oh, of course you'll come back in the office. But there are people, I know some of my family clients, where they've got some serious issues because the, the people don't want to come back in the office and they're happy being on Zoom while they walk their dog. And that's being very effective and efficient. And so some of those issues force us to think, what business are we in? The world has changed. Is that business going to be the business that I really want to stay in for the next five or, or, or ten years? What else should I be doing with my money? How can I minimise my risk uh, por por portfolio? So I think it's a question of bringing some urgency to the table and not just thinking to everyone, well, the COVID's going to be away. It's all going to be finalised in a year or two. We don't have to worry. I think part of our attitude at Point Made to our clients is, nah. -uh, don't have that attitude. You've got to be a bit more aggressive about looking at where you are and where you want to head as a result of COVID. Now is time to experiment a little bit. Take some risk factor in a small way. Don't bet the whole farm, but now's the time to maybe do things in tune with what's happening in the global economy that you may not have been able or didn't want to do previously. So experiment with something else is another attitude we've been pushing. And you've previously mentioned the importance of conducting regular health checks of family businesses to monitor and rate the performance of their operations from a family relationship level and, and family dynamic level. Take us through your evaluation on the health and, and current strength of the family business sector based on your experience that you've seen. Yes, it's going to be a bit difficult doing it face to face. I'd rather give you a document which would have about 40 questions, Rob, and then I'll tell you whether you've got a healthy family or not. But it goes to the essence of a family in business together. But it doesn't necessarily need to be a family in business together. It might be investments together. It just might be sitting around the kitchen table as a family. But it goes to the qualitative issues of life rather than the quantitative issues. And so I'm dealing with a lot of wealthy families. I have the privilege of working with a lot of wealthy families whose names are in lights. You can't tell them anything about business because they've got an impeccable track record. But what I've found over the last 12 years, when it comes to their family, they're in denial. Initially it's, oh, everything's fine, oh, there's a few little tensions between the sisters and the brothers, but they'll get over it. But there's not really unity, there's not really harmony, and there's a lack of family continuity. Because the parents often are in denial. And they don't want to go there and have these sensitive questioning, sensitive discussions with their kids about a range of issues. And the most avoided issue is about what am I going to do with my wealth? Who's going to get what? And so what happens, because we're not comfortable about talking about wealth and money and all those type of things, it stays under the table, it stays in our suitcases. And then the family has a tradition that gets carried on from generation to generation of not talking about these things. So I've got a range of 17, 18 year old baby boomers, okay? 
baby boomers that have had tremendous business success. And though they're even in their 70s and 80s, they've not yet addressed the issue of what they're going to do with their wealth with their children. And their children today are in their 40s and 50s. And so what happens is I then label them, they're in the fractured families list. And it doesn't matter how many squillions they've got, if you haven't got a meaningful relationship with your kids, if you haven't got that openness and, and unity to be able to talk about a range of issues and create a safe environment and give everyone, from the oldest to the youngest, from the smartest to the not so smartest, a voice at the table, whether they're involved in the family business or not, then you're going to have the potential for tension. And if that's not addressed, it goes to conflict. And from conflict, then you get a fractured family. That's the focus at the moment. So there's a mounting crisis in Australia because too many wealthy families are not addressing the issues of succession, of entitlement, and who's going to get the wealth. And you've obviously got a, a passion for this sector and, and for this sort of family advisory field. Where did that originate from? I think I read Point Made was launched sometime in the late 90s, potentially 2000s. Where did, where did the passion and, and energy for that come it from? Came about, it came about very simply, Rob, when the Smorgan family broke up in 1995 after 70 years of harmony and togetherness and great financial and business success, we imploded. And uh, it was a very sad occasion. And other members of the family will have different views about that. But to me, it was very sad that we weren't able to continue the, tr the tradition into the fourth and fifth generation, like so many families do. Because for many years, the Smorgan family, we had the right recipe. We had the right formula. Yes, there were bumps in the road and there were hurdles we had to jump and there was yelling and screaming and we'd settle down and we got on with the business. Um, and that all ended in 1995. And so I went away and said, what could we have done? Because at that time, we didn't find the suitable fa uh, family advisors to help us ask the right questions, to help us resolve the issues. And maybe if we had the right advisors and different advisors, it might have been a different result. You'll never know. And so I went and, and did a lot of studying. I bought every book I could find on family businesses. I went a few, did a few courses with YPO, Young Presidents Organization. And um, I found that the most important thing in family advisory is not to deal with the money, not to deal with the quantity, deal with the quality. Deal with all those issues that people of wealth struggle with, the same as those people that don't have that wealth struggle with. Every one of us have got our own fears have got our own resentment, have got our own concerns, have got our own ambitions. You as an individual are part of a family and a healthy family, a vibrant family, a family that believes in unity and harmony, gives every single person a voice at that table in a safe environment. So if you're not the brightest business person or you're not interested in being in business, you're a violinist, you're a musician, why can't you express yourself and still play a role within that family structure? You shouldn't be alienated. You shouldn't be made to feel inferior because you're not a business person. And so many families that are well known in business, they alienate their kids because someone is not interested nor capable of participating in the family business. That's going to lead to friction. That's going to lead to tension. And that's going to lead to a fractured family because then how do the parents deal with that particular individual when push comes to shove and they've got to make a decision about who's going to get what? And when a client approaches you, where do you start? You start with asking the first fundamental question, Rob, what do you want to achieve? How can I help you achieve your aims and objectives? Because they all vary. And I've had the pleasure and privilege of working with many family clients. And yes, there's a common theme. Most of it is, I just want the kids to like each other, to respect each other, and get around the Christmas table or the Passover table because it upsets me and my wife or my husband and I, whatever the case may be, because some kids aren't coming because their brother or sisters are there or because we've had a falling out with mum or dad. It's basic, simple stuff. So push, put the wealth to one side. I've really got no interest how much they're worth because wealthy to some might be a million dollars and to others it might be a billion dollars. Wealth is irrelevant. But the focus on so many families is about the quantity of the wealth and our focus is on the quality of their life, the health of the family, as indicated how do they communicate with each other? How do they talk to each other? How do they respect each other? Okay, all those simple things. And that's what comes out through what we would call a point made health check, 
So it's a pretty accurate assessment initially. And there's a few tweaks along the way because sometimes people don't actually call it as it is. But you only have to go and meet the kids and meet the family and all of a sudden we see these are the issues where they're divided and these are the issues where they're connected. And so what we need to do is reduce the issues where they're divided and get more on the other side of the ledger of what connects them. And how did you find the response from the business community once you'd launched the business and, and what are some of the most common challenges that your clients are experiencing in the, in the current environment? Well, the current environment, as we discussed earlier, uh, in a lot of sectors it's tough. Uh, if you're in the property business, property values might be going up but there's not as many deals to be done and so therefore, you know, the business is not making as much as what it ought to be in the, in the, in, in the good days. Um, I think the lack of communication within a lot of families, the lack of clarity about how to even deal through these tough times, and particularly if you're in one of those sectors that's doing it tough, people don't know. It's all right in the good times. Everything's hunky-dory. We're buying new cars and new apartments and travelling around. Now it's tight in the belt time and a lot of people don't know how to deal with crisis. And so that's part of where the advice comes in, to be realistic about the, the, you know, the, the, the situation. Look. There's a lot of accountants and a lot of lawyers say they do family advisory work. And no disrespect for them, there's a role for them to play. But in my experience of doing this work for 12 years and listening to all of my clients, most of them don't get down and dirty. They're not going to ask the patriarch or the matriarch, what's keeping you awake at night, Rob? What do you want your legacy to be, Rob? And some might say, I want to be the richest guy in the cemetery. Well, that's fine. If that's what your objective is, you're leaving your kids behind, you're not interested or that you don't rate them, it's not important for you. That's their call because they do have choices. Every one of us has got a choice to make about our family. And if you just want to be the richest guy in the cemetery, you'll continue to focus 100% of your time on the business and you'll leave the family behind. I would hope by the work that we do, if there's any semblance of wanting family harmony and unity, they will want to have a closer family unit, they'll want to listen to others and they'll see they've got choices and options to make that balance it up between the business and the family. And so the healthy families would be spending a lot of time on their family as much as nearly as what they do on their business. To what extent do you rely on the Smorgan Way philosophy in your dealings with some of these families? Well, the Smorgan Way was a, was a statement about how we like to do business. Respect each other, no raised voices, two heads are better than one, um, putting back to the community, giving back. It was a basic philosophy that drove our decision making and drove the way we do business. You might have seen it in my foyer, it's on the, on the, on the, on the, um, on the, the board outside and that still drives me and Point Made and often a lot of my clients come and say, gee, that's interesting, they want to explain, they want to take it away and adopt it themselves. So you just can't duplicate somebody else's way because it doesn't work. You've got to make it very personable, personable to, to your situation and that's what that does. Now in your role as a family advisor, I think in 2014 you joined PwC as Executive Chairman of Family Advisory. That take was a us, bit of a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> take us through your, your couple of years there and then why did you go out on your own again? Well it was five years at PwC, five years at PwC and I never would have dreamt uh, I was ever going to work for a professional services firm. But I must say, it was a really uh, fascinating and informative five-year period. And I'm pleased that the outcome was that PwC went into the family advisory space. Uh, we were successful in getting a lot of new clients to PwC that started off as family advisory and now moved in to tax, M&A, or whatever the case may be. So that was good. But frankly, PwC came to me a couple of years ago and said, David, we'd like you to sign a five-year contract, which is very nice of them particularly when they're tapping other partners on the back at 55 and say, thanks very much. Um, but I was uh, 71 and a half at the time. I said, guys, thank you very much. But, you know, at my stage in my life, I really don't want to be signing five-year contracts. And um, so we did a very uh, pleasant deal where I bought back Point Made from them. And so some of the team from PwC joined me back at Point Made doing the same family advisory work. So I put it down. It was a great experience for me. I, I felt I, I did my very best for them. They're a very good employee and um, it was a great experience. 
And what about the growth of the Point Made business? I think it's been in operation for circa nine or so years now, but how have you actually managed the growth of the business and are there more clients now than there were 10 years ago, given that the wealth of people on the fractured family list or the AFR rich list is only increasing? It's a, it's a very defined business that we want to be, aspire to be Australia's preeminent family advisory firm, but we're only based in, in, in Melbourne and we're really at the pointy end of town because that's where I think the real issues are and that's where we go from the rich list to the fractured families list. And our job is to keep the families not only rich, but rich in their family environment as well. And we've got a different process, frankly, that's a lot of others sort of adapt to and are, are similar but it really gets to the nitty gritty. I need to understand the real Rob Langdon to try and help you and your family before I come up with solutions and options for you. And you're gonna be different to Billy Brown and, and, and Janet Smith, right? That, that's just the reality of it. And it's the ability to listen, it's the ability to understand what they want to achieve and then provide some options and choices for them to make. Because it's not our job as family advisors to sit in judgment. You ask me for an opinion about how you're doing things or what you should do, I'll give it to you. But I don't sit in judgment and say, Rob, you're wrong doing this. I can't impose my values on your values. But we can have a meaningful discussion that those get flushed out. So the process has been working. Um, I'm very pleased. I'm probably working a bit harder than what I would have envisaged, but I love making a difference. And so when I get a phone call, like I did uh, a couple of phone calls this year, day after Christmas on Boxing Day, David, I just want to thank you. We actually went to mum and dad's and we had an incredible time. I never thought it was possible during the year, but thanks to you and your team's work, we actually got to Christmas. Well, you hang up the phone and you've made a difference, Rob. David, I wanted to ask you, in your experience, how significant is the gap between generations in terms of decision-making and risk appetite? And then how do you bridge that gap? Oh, I think in a lot of cases, Rob, it's huge. And it comes back to some of the things we were talking about earlier. If you don't have a structure in place within your family to talk about some of those issues on a regular, informal or formal basis, you inevitably are setting up a higher risk profile that there's going to be a disconnect between the generations. And on the other hand, if you have a structure in place where you have regular family discussions and you're giving every family member a voice and they understand who they are, what they stand for, and where you're going as a family. So let's just go, who are you? What do you stand for? And where you're going as a family, you've got a much higher chance of connectivity with all of your family members. So the gap that you call between the generations is not there because you brought everyone along on the same page, on the same path. And tragically, what leads to this fractured family list is when that doesn't happen when the patriarch or the matriarch decide it's our money, it's not the family's money. I've done it, I've created it, it's my money, I'm gonna make that call. That's fine, but that's the dictator, that's the general. That's not gonna be the best way to bring their family, the next generation, onto the same path as what they are. Now, presumably when clients approach you and, and some of these wealthy families approach you, they are seeking help, but are there any examples of, of families or, or clients that you haven't been able to assist with just because they're not open to the suggestions? One of the things I learned, Rob, when I, I did various courses was sometimes people are impossible and it wouldn't matter how good you are, what advice you gave them, what choices you gave them, they're not prepared to help themselves. And so there's been a couple of cases I can think of where the patriarch uh, in particular has not wanted to be vulnerable. He wasn't prepared to sit with his kids in a safe environment and hear comments from the children about how he was not as a businessman, but as a father. And he couldn't cope with that. It all got too hard. Okay, so we tried and he couldn't cope with it. And I said, but your aim is to have a happy united family. Your aim is to bring your kids closer together with you. And so part of the hard yards you've got to do, you have to hear their reaction because you're an absentee father. You weren't there on a Saturday morning going to the netball or the basketball or the football. You're in the business. And that was all understandable in the early days. But the kids don't understand it today because you've got all the money in the world. You're living in the middle of Turak. You've got three cars. You've got a happy wife, all the money in the world. But the kids need to get it off their chest. 
And so if you don't have that safe environment, the, you don't provide the opportunity for the kids to tell their parents as it is, that leads to a breakdown. And so I've had a couple of cases of that where the patriarch, too hot in the kitchen, not prepared to be vulnerable, left it. Nothing else I could do. And what about when clients uh, approach you? How, what is it that brings them to you over others, do you think? Is it the, the family name, the family experience? Oh, why? Well, you know, can, I, I know what brings them to us, mm. whether it's us or any other family advisor. There's usually a catalyst for that. Often it's they've listened to a mate that's just uh, told him a story about how his kids you know, aren't talking to him anymore or they've stormed out. Uh, or there's a divorce in the family, or there's usually a catalyst from the pick up a phone or send an email, I've heard of the work you do. But it's not yet very well publicised. I mean, I know every time there's an article about breakup in family businesses, or we talk about what we're doing at Point Made or others, the phone rings. And not often the catalyst is just reading that newspaper, reading that article, or unfortunately, looking at what's happening in some of the very well-known families, they're in court with each other, and people think, oh my God, how do I sit in this? Where do I sit? Where do I sit with my family? Why they pick Point Made than anybody else would, you'd have to ask them. I think it's been opportune and very good that I've been there and done it. So the Smorgan experience, I think, Smorgan is a well-known name, certainly in Victoria. The fact that we were a very successful family that then imploded, I think people recognise, well, David must have learned something through that process and maybe he could help us. And just pivoting slightly to, to two topics. One, when you were at Consolidated Industries, uh, what were you doing there? What was your role over the, the journey that you were there? I think you were there for about 50 years, but... Hey, come on, I was only there for 25 years. 25 years. Uh, I, was there for, I was there from 1972 to 1996. And um, uh, before that, I was a lawyer, and I was only a lawyer for nine months. I hated that. And then um, Victor Smorgan, our chairman, collared me at my brother Rodney's engagement party and said, I heard you're not enjoying the law. Why don't you come out to the factory in Somerville Road, West Footscray, and get a real job? Well, that real job was starting down in the gut house. Uh, not exactly the place to start your career, but we learnt the hard way, and I now use my experiences to encourage others to get their kids down and dirty. And so from the gut house, we went through the offal room and then you went to the boning room and then the slaughterhouse. And then after about five years or so, you make it into an administration job or selling job in the case in, in the meatworks. And so you do the hard yards first. There's no substitute for that. You just can't come in because you've got the right surname and think you're going to be a, a big time executive. It doesn't work. And the Western Bulldogs, you were the president there for 15 years. Why did you take that role on and what did you learn? No one else wanted to take it on. <laughs> um, and again, look, I followed the Bulldogs since I was a kid, since 1954. And um, I mean, I maybe aspired to play league football in my dreams, but I never aspired to become a president. And I wasn't supposed to be the president because there were four guys where we put our hand up or our hands were put up for us to join a subcommittee looking at, is there a future for the Footscray Football Club? And I was one of those, there's no future. We've got no money no players, no coach and no hope. That was the attitude I went in with. And it's amazing when you start focusing and you lock yourselves in a room as we did from August in 1996 to probably December, the end of that year, uh, full time just looking at options and choices. And the crystallising moment was when we looked at the map of Victoria and we looked at the western part of Victoria, forget about Geelong because they're farmers down there, the western part Hang on, that's Footscray, that's the Bulldogs territory. But Footscray was just a small little suburb there that had moved from very white Anglo-Saxon and now into Vietnamese community. So we couldn't rely really on Footscray to give the support, but hang on, what about in Werribee and Hoppers Crossing and, and, and all that out through um, uh, that whole Western region, it's open territory. And we had Essendon on one side and then North Melbourne down there. We said, hang on, this is it. We've got to be the Western, the Western Club, the Western Bulldogs, um, which was great. And then I was threatened. <laughs> I was going to be sued, you know, destroying 100 years of tradition and naming rights. And we got over that. And probably that strategy that we had was probably we were just 10 years too, too slow. I mean, it took probably 20 years for that to be successful as compared to the 10 years we thought. But today, 
the kids in the kindergarten and grades one and two and three in Sunbury and Keelor and all that area, they don't know Collingwood, they don't know Essendon, they know the Western Bulldogs. Mm. And helped by, of course, our premiership win in 2016. So um, looking back, it was a brilliant move. And what about the game today? Do you still have a, a love for it and a passion yeah, well, for absolutely. it? absolutely. Still go regularly? I, well, when I can, <laughs> apart from COVID. But now I go with my children. I'm blessed to have nine grandchildren. We all go together and um, it's one of the wonderful things. I, I, I enjoy today sitting in the outer uh, with them, so to speak, as compared to being in the inner sanctum because it was actually 16 years, I think, Rob, I was president and a lot of lunches, a lot of networking, uh, a lot of proud moments, a lot of disappointing moments. It was an incredible experience and a privilege to, to, to do that. And um, I look back and I think I learned a lot um, in a business sense, in a personal sense. And um, I did my very best. I went in there with the attitude, I, I want to go and do my very best. I want to look myself in the mirror the day that I finish. And so I gave it my very best and what we achieved, we achieved. And what we didn't achieve, well, I can't do anything about it anymore. I gave it 100%. On reflection, what does David Smorgan consider his biggest achievements over the course of your career? my family. The fact that I've got three wonderful sons, three beautiful daughters-in-law and nine grandchildren. My mother, my mother is still alive at 94, nearly 94. Uh, my brothers and their families, my wife of course, my second wife Kathy. I lost my first wife Rosalind to cancer back in 2008 and was very lucky to find Kathy and we've been married now for just on 10 years. So I would say it's, it's my family. And to the contrary, is there anything you'd do differently in, in hindsight or if you had a, another opportunity? Oh, I probably wouldn't make as many hasty decisions before I invested or spent my dollar. Uh, I've, like everyone, I've, always, I've, I've had some failures. And when I reflect on that, it was probably because I didn't understand the business. I shouldn't have gone there. Sometimes I misread the people. And thirdly, I probably didn't do enough extensive due diligence because I'm pretty much a generalist. And I think sometimes when you're investing serious money, uh, you've got to do the due diligence. And if you don't do it, you've got to have a team that then does it for you. So I think those three things would be, I'd do them different if I had the time again. But I've got no regrets. I, I find I live every day, I wake up in the morning, I've got my list of things to do. And you get off your backside and go and make it happen. And I'm a big believer it's up to you. Um, I hear too many people wanting to delegate and blame others. Fundamentally, I think you've got to position yourself, you've got to take responsibility and you have to make it happen. You've sort of answered my, my next question there, which is what are the two or three fundamental pieces of advice you can pass on? Be yourself. You don't need to try and be like your brother or your father or your uncle or your auntie or whoever, okay? You've got to be yourself. Every one of us have got something that's special. Every one of us. What we've got to try and identify, what is special for you? Not for your parents or not for your brothers, as I said. What's the special thing for you? What's your special thing that you've got that makes a difference for you? And when you understand that, go and do it. Like, it's taken me 50 years to understand really what I'm doing. I'm having as much fun now and much enjoyment from doing what I'm doing than I think I've had in all my career. And I've done some wonderful things. I've been blessed to have, you know, working in a wonderful family business for 25 years. I then was the chairman of Family Business Australia for seven years, traveled Australia, met some incredible families doing things together, whatever. Then I had the Bulldogs 16 years experience. And then the last 12 years or so as a, as a consultant. Again, life is a transition, Rob. And some of us are lucky not to be stuck in the one job, day in, day out, week in, week in, year in, year out, and all these experiences add up. So be yourself, find out what's special for you, and then go and make it happen. You're still a young man, so what's the next 10, 20, 30 years look like for David Smorgan? I'm very fortunate. I've, I've got reasonable health, reasonable fitness within reason. Um, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. My clients seem to get on with me and we get on with them. So I wouldn't be looking more than continue to do this for the next few years. Uh, I'm very fortunate. I've had to walk the talk and I've had to, my own succession plan. So I'm very fortunate. My three sons are running all of our investment portfolios. They're running our operating businesses. We still work as a team, but their responsibility is that, to allow me the time to focus on what I enjoy doing and that's family advisory. So I hope that continues. I'm not sure I'll find some new field because uh, I think this is enough. I've got enough on the plate at the moment. David, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the program. Thanks so much for your time.